Funding for the following presentation is provided by a grant from UConn Extension and is a cooperative effort of UConn Extension and the Risk Management Agency Division of the USDA. My name is John Beauvais. I'm an assistant professor and extension economist in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Connecticut. This is a webinar called Look Before You Leap, Assessing the Profitability of Growing Different Crops or Raising Different Livestock. And I'm going to talk with you about ways that you can assess new crop or livestock operations using publicly available resources. How should you assess economically the viability of growing new crops or raising a different species of livestock? You should consider the expected costs of growing or raising them, and also consider the expected revenues. You should also compare your expected costs and revenues with expected costs and revenues from your current operation. And expectations are the key to understanding this kind of assessment. We can't know for sure what costs or revenues are going to look like, but we can do our best to try to improve our understanding of expected costs and revenues. Cost and return studies are a type of publicly available study that can be a very helpful resource if you're considering starting a new type of crop or livestock operation. They provide case studies of the costs associated with operations, provide evidence on the revenues from these operations. These are pros of cost and return studies, but they're not frequently updated and they're not particularly geographically widespread, although extension services and universities in many states do provide them. In my opinion, the best series of cost and return studies has been published by the University of California for many decades. I'm going to give you some examples from the University of California's report back in 2007 on costs to establish and produce Fuji apples in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Part of the reason I chose this study is I thought that it might be somewhat similar to apple operations in Connecticut. The foothills are of a medium elevation um, and the, the soil and climate may be somewhat more similar to Connecticut than other parts of California. Also, the five-acre orchard is, um, is, could be somewhat, some, somewhat representative for, of Connecticut's smaller orchards. So I don't want to go through the details here, but I just want to show you the level of details that the University of California's cost and return studies provide. They break down cost per acre in each of the first five years, and you can see quite clearly that the costs are much higher in the first year for planting than they are in subsequent years. Um, and they break it down in great detail, showing many details of, of the planting and culture uh, processes. Um, this is part of about a 20-page report, and in the text of the report, it goes into all the detail that you need to really understand the assumptions and how they arrived at these estimates of cost. Going into more detail on culturing, cultural, cultural practices, um, you can see the labor cost can be quite high for certain tasks. Um, for other tasks, it's more about material. They also break down the cost by month. So you can see, for example, pruning has to take place in January and July. And you can use budgets like these to help plan your own budget as an operation. They have many different cost and return studies. Here's another sample. In fact, the University of California Davis has put out 93 cake studies for 40 crops and also for beef. These are current studies only. There are also hundreds of archived studies. Um, but this, these, these are static case studies, so they're PDFs. They're not intended for you to use in an interactive way, but as a reference. There are also interactive spreadsheets provided by a number of other universities. Some of the better ones are 
have been provided by Penn State University. They've done studies for 25 crops and 26 animals, um, and they seem to be continuing to update those studies. Closer to here, Cornell and UMass Amherst have put out um, uh, some, some studies, eight, eight from Cornell and 11 from, Mass from Massachusetts, but um, they're a bit out of date. They're, they're a little bit older than the, the recently updated studies from UC Davis or Penn State. So here in Connecticut, I'm planning on undertaking a series of cost and return studies for Connecticut crops. I identified blueberries and eggplants and began to collect a little bit of data in the early part of 2018. Um, these are going to be my first crops because the studies have not been done here locally and they are crops that are grown in relatively commonly by uh, more than 100 farmers in Connecticut. The first wave of data collection and interviews is going to take place toward the end of 2018. As I said, I did collect a little bit of data earlier in the year, um, but we're really going to start getting underway with that and probably in December after the growing season is really over. Um, and then we're going to put out our first wave of published reports in 2019. So the process for this is going to be engagement with farmers. I'm going to reach out to growers for in-person conversations, both one-on-one -on -one conversations on farms and roundtable discussions. I'm going to collect information on their crop growing, crop growing practices. And then I'll draft a report on a representative farm, not an average farm, but a representative uh, farm that would be a good example to follow for other farmers who are looking to get into it. And I'll get, undertake this in collaboration with other extension colleagues and then get feedback from growers and make revisions as necessary. So this is the type of information that farmers are going to be asked to provide. For example, in my eggplant study, we're going to want to know about labor costs and machine costs, units of seeds and, and fertilizers needed. We're not going to ask about the dollar value of costs. We're going to figure that out um, using market prices. Okay, so that covers some of the resources that are available for estimating the cost of growing a new crop or um, raising new a new species of livestock. What about prices, the other part of the equation? Well, a couple of good resources that are available are USDA's AMS, Agricultural Marketing Service, market news reports, and in collaboration with the Vermont government, the Local Foods Data Tracking Program. There's also the Connecticut Department of Agriculture's Weekly Agricultural Report, which relies on AMS data, but that's quite accessible locally and you can sub subscribe to that weekly newsletter in your email or in the mail. AMS's market news portal looks like this. Um, you can go to the website and click to see uh, different types of reports based on location and based on commodity. So if you click, if you click here, you can see the terminal market report, you can see the shipping point report, for example. Um, so these are the reports that contain the price information, shipping point and terminal market. They're a little bit different. Shipping point data are data on prices paid for specialty crops traded near um, the farm, nearer to the farm, um, and also at points of entry into the U.S. These are for 36 states, available for 36 states, not Connecticut, but Massachusetts, Maine, New Jersey, and New York. And yeah, they're a little bit um, more. They're a little. They, they resemble a little bit better farm gate prices than the terminal market price data do. Terminal market data are a little further downstream. They're probably just the last step before the produce gets to the retailer or the restaurant. So it reflects prices paid for specialty crops at these terminal markets in about 15 cities in the U.S. The data look like. This. this is an example for New York shipping point data, and you can see these commodities are New York, Gala, and Macintosh apples, U.S. extra fancy grade. It tells you the size, tells you when they were grown, and it also tells you the high and low price. 
paid on this particular day when I gathered the data. Um, so it gives you a range of prices paid at wholesale. It's going to probably be a little bit higher than the price the farmer is going to receive, but you can monitor trends using this data from AMS. The terminal market, um, as I said, it's a little bit further downstream, so the prices are going to tend to be a little bit higher, but they're not always going to be. And it works essentially the same way. There's also AMS market news data available for livestock, poultry, and grain, but it's not in the same format. And it's probably not as useful for long-term business planning because it's not in the same format. You can look at the livestock, dairy, and poultry outlook for uh, assessment of what may be happening in the future. These are monthly reports, and they focus largely on um, both past trends and uh, issues such as effects of trade and foreign demand on producer prices. The last reference that I'd like to mention is the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, Local Food Data Tracking. As I said, this is in collaboration with USDA AMS. And it's essentially a survey of prices paid at farmers markets for both organic and non-organic products in Connecticut, I'm sorry, in Vermont. And so again, this may be a helpful guide, but prices are highly local. Um, farmers markets in Vermont are different from farmers markets in Connecticut. They're different from farmers markets in California. So um, it may be helpful to look at trends using these real-time data from AMS, but it may not be as helpful in terms of establishing what price you're going to set for your products. Thank you very much for tuning in for this webinar. Um, I'm John Beauvais with the Yukon Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics, and this is part of a larger extension program we have at Yukon. Um, so please tune in for our other webinars and look forward to more programming on financial and risk management. Thank you very much.